Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. We've got a special guest tonight. He's special for lots of reasons. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have Dr. Scott Hahn back on the Journey Home. You've seen him in many programs at EWTN. You've probably read his books. I hope you have. But he's also special because he's an old classmate of mine from seminary. And sometimes it still amazes me when I look over there at you. I can, I'm sure you may be able to see it in, in my old age, but I can still see the young you with the... Uh, you had a beard then at times, right? Or mustache? Mustache. Mustache. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, I, but I remember the the enthusiasm and uh, zeal and fervency that you had for Calvin and Calvinism uh, even more than than I did. More Far, than most people. More than. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yes, that's, or another, any that's another story. <laughs> but it's also though to see that same. A deep commitment and zeal and fervency still in your love for the Catholic Church. Right. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about, but the audience is an important part of the program, so I want to remind you of the phone number if you'd like to give us a call. We're going to kind of run this like an open line first Monday since Scott's a returning guest. We have a lot to talk about tonight, so if you want to give us a call, get in there quick. 1-800-221-9460 outside North America, 205-271. 2980, or you can send an email to journeyhome at ewtn.com. It's an old tradition. Welcome to the Journey Home. It's great to be back, Marcus. It's great to be back. It's great to be back. In fact, I would just mention for the show, 30 years ago is when I began seminary. 30 years ago, and you were just about ready. Yeah, we've begun our 30th year of marriage, and right after we got back from our honeymoon, we packed up the U-Haul and drove up to Boston to the North Shore to begin the Gordon Conwell <laughs> right around the same time. You know, it's funny. This is completely off topic. It's just Friends, gossip. Gordon Conwell wasn't my first choice. I had actually, it was between Princeton and, and, and Gordon Conwell, and I tried to decide. And You chose wisely. I chose <laughs> Gordon Conwell because it was the Young Life School, because I right. thought I was going to really be Young was. Life. Was that your first choice, Gordon Conwell? Or? It was, yeah. I had a couple other choices, but when professors were shuffled around, yeah. it became pretty clear. I wanted to study under M.G. Klein, Roger Nicole, and the lineup there was very impressive. Still it is. just shows the difference. You were, you were doing the intelligent thing, the professors. <laughs> I made sure they had racquetball courts and a basketball court, and you know that's what I was looking for oh, when yeah. I went to seminary. So. I recall. Well, every uh, Journey Home program in uh, this open line format, I invite the returning guest to give a little five-minute or so summary of the story of what brought you into the church. I'll do it. You know, we were talking before, in fact, we've been catching up for the, the whole afternoon. Yep. It's yep. been a lot of fun. It's the year of St. Paul. What an amazing yep. time to be together because here is the great example, the model convert, perhaps the most thoroughly converted man in Christian history. And as I was reflecting on his life the last few weeks after the year began in late June, I began to notice some parallels between his life and mine because you know he was raised as a Roman citizen in the foremost power of his day and he was cultured and well-educated so that in his early teens, there in Tarsus, he made a decision to go and study under arguably the greatest theologian of that mm -hmm. century, Rabban Gamaliel. Most of them were called rabbis, but he was the first rabbi to be called Rabban, which means our teacher. Uh, there was a saying among the rabbis that when Gamaliel died, the glory of the Torah perished. And so <laughs> as a teenager or in his early 20s, he went to study under Gamaliel. And I look back at my own life because I was converted to Christ through young life in my mid-teens. And then for the next several years, I pursued scripture with this holy fervor. And I would go to Grove City College, I went to Gordon Conwell Seminary, because as you said, I lined it up and I saw these are the men who are going to make the, the scriptures come alive. And so I had my own Gamaliels. But just as uh, Saul, the Pharisee, who had graduated as a prized pupil under this great, great professor, came to a sudden decisive turning point in his own life in his mid to late 20s, so also I did, after graduating top of my class as a, an evangelical Christian with strong anti-Catholic convictions, my love for scripture was always greater than my, my contempt for Catholic ritualism and superstition. And so as I found in the fathers more connections between the old and the new, and in their homilies they made the Bible come alive, I kept absorbing more and more, going deeper and deeper and discovering baptism is a lot more than I realized. The Eucharist is more than just symbolism and, and ritual. And so in my late 20s, you know, with so much coming up Catholic, I made a decision that looked and felt a lot like professional suicide. <laughs> losing a job, yeah. losing family members, friendship, and you know, all kinds of things. 
but discovering that really the fullness of my faith as an evangelical Bible-believing Christian was not something that I had to reject, but just take to the next level. Mm -hmm. That there was more good news than I thought maybe 10 or 12 years earlier. And I think of Saul that way too, because we call him a convert, but he didn't convert from one religion to another. He converted from one understanding of Judaism as a Pharisee to a much deeper and higher understanding because he had always waited for the Messiah, mm -hmm. Only later did he find out that he had arrived and that he was persecuting him by persecuting his followers. And so for me, I wasn't just non-Catholic, I was anti-Catholic and in a loving sort of way, I tried to target my Catholic friends and help them to see the error of their ways until I discovered the error of my ways, my anti-Catholic ways. And so in 86, at the Easter Vigil in Milwaukee, I was received into the church. and. Uh, it's just been ongoing conversion since then, as it was for Paul. Well, in case the audience doesn't know the, the deeper story, uh, Rome Sweet Home came out when? 93. 93, you and Kimberly yeah. wrote, wrote that together. We did in three weeks with a lot of prayer and tears and laughter <laughs> <laughs> and editing each other. You know, something else that I wanted to mention uh, uh, before we go on to these other t topics is, I remember from your story, and this affected me a lot when my own journey is that one of the, the uh, key places for you in your journey was the first time you went into Mass and you saw the Bible come alive. And I'm thinking that there's an awful lot of people, Catholics, that go into Mass and they don't see it. Right. And to me that emphasizes our need for catechesis and Scripture and knowing our faith so that the Mass comes alive. That's right. The Bible alone is not enough. But the mass alone, without any biblical literacy, can often fall short. You know, I, I think back to when I first converted as a teenager in high school. You know, fresh out of juvenile court, I needed the gospel. Hmm. But I remember going to a Bible study that was tackling the book of Revelation. Bad idea. You know, <laughs> you start in the back of the Bible with the hardest book of all. But we spent months speculating about the Antichrist, the second coming. And then I went to a second Bible study about a year later, and they were doing the same thing, only from a different vantage point. You know, I, I gave up after a little while and just went back to the Gospels and read the Bible all the way through a couple of times in high school. In college, I remember taking advanced Greek and being assigned in a tutorial the translation of the entire Apocalypse, all 22 chapters. When I was done, I still didn't know what it was talking about. But, you know, I was going on to <laughs> seminary, it didn't matter. But I remember when I went into Mass the, for the very first time, I was a doctoral student, I had been studying the Fathers, I had been going deeper, I had been finding so much truth about the Eucharist about baptism, about the saints and the seven sacraments, but I never once darkened the doorways of a Catholic church to attend Mass. And I didn't want to, but I was curious enough, you know, when I found out that it would be a, you know, a, a, a midday Mass at noon in a basement chapel, that sounded safe. And so I went with a Bible and a notebook, but I had, no, I had no preparation for how scripturally saturated the Mass would be. I mean, from the opening rite, through the penitential rite, to the liturgy of the word, it was the old and the new. It had been a, a year or two since I had heard that much scripture. And then in the second half of the mass, the liturgy of the Eucharist was where the scriptures just took off. As soon as I heard, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, I'm flipping to the back of the New Testament, looking down in the book of Revelation, where Jesus is called Lamb 28 times in 22 chapters. And I ne never knew why. And as I'm looking at Lamb of God, I'm seeing holy, holy, holy. There's the Alleluia, the Amen liturgical <laughs> songs and prayers and, you know, basically the Mass finally made the Apocalypse understandable. But for me, the Apocalypse is what illuminated the mystery of what was taking place yeah. in the Mass. We were going to heaven, whether we knew it or not, the angels and <laughs> saints were surrounding us. This is the year of St. Paul. Yes. And, uh, and in some ways, uh, it was a good choice to call your institute St. Paul's Institute because it, you know, it really connected right. everything. But, you know, that wasn't accidental. I mean, that's really your own desire, I think, as God's calling you to recognize the beauty of St. Paul and his writings, but mm -hmm. also his conversion. In what right. way have you come to see St. Paul's conversion itself as truly unique? Maybe, in fact, as you were describing it to me in a way that I had not seen. Well, you know, St. Paul, it, it's been said that St. Paul was such a great apostle because Saul was such a great persecutor. No, God just simply redirected and harnessed that energy in a, in a, in a proper direction. I'm going to correction you. Some of you might not catch that that's the same guy. That's right. <laughs> Saul was the Pharisee who hunted Christians down to arrest them and put them to death until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But Jesus doesn't ask him, you know, why are you persecuting my followers? 
He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, and, and think about the mental gymnastics that this poor Pharisee had to go through, even while getting blindness suddenly. You know, he's like, well, first of all, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Okay, and he's thinking, well, I'm not persecuting, I'm persecuting your followers, but you're the Lord, and you seem to take it pretty personally, you know? <laughs> I mean, in the first century, there's only one Christian author who speaks of the church as, quote, the body of Christ. And guess who it is? St. Paul. Because Saul the Pharisee discovered that the followers of Jesus aren't just, you know, embracing a theory or a group of opinions. They have been united to nothing less than the Lord of Lords. And so it is for, for Saul to discover that, you know, he, he, he accepts the Word of God, he's doing his very best, but he's missing something very important. I can relate to that because as an anti-Catholic, <laughs> I was simply following the Bible, or so I thought, until the Bible illuminated the mystery of Christ in the Eucharist. And at that point, I'm like, oh, wait, all bets are off. I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board and rethink all of this, you know. And, you know, Saul took three years shortly after becoming a Christian, getting baptized, to spend time in prayer and study in Arabia. I remember spending three years in intensive study and prayer doing doctoral research while I was going through this process of entering the church. And I can see the need because suddenly you're rereading passages that you have read and taught sometimes dozens of times, only things are jumping off the page and you wonder, how could I have missed John 6? <laughs> how could I have missed Romans 6 about baptism? Matthew 16 about Peter and the rock and the keys of the kingdom. These, these were the sort of things that I, I discovered, but I can't imagine, but that Paul, as a newly baptized Christian, went back and reread the Law and the Prophets and just probably wondered, how could I have missed Jesus? You know, we often think of St. Paul as this great evangelist and missionary and, and writer, but maybe don't appreciate the fact, just like you had mentioned earlier, that you were, you were doing a, 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 you know, a suicide for your career. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, there's an interesting statement, which doesn't necessarily deal with Paul, but the whole... The priest. The, the priest, yes. where he says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And that little line just explodes into men whose lives are just thrown open for what are they going to do? It, it, it's so good that you bring that up because, you know, we read those kinds of verses over and over and never really get it. But here is the chief priest labeling Jesus a false messiah, a blasphemer, and using Roman authority to have him executed. Here are the priests who are under the chief priest, you know, reaching a, a decision where they're saying, no, we, we, you know, we just <laughs> murdered the Messiah. We didn't just miss him. We had him executed. <laughs> We're going to join his cause. I mean, the chief priest is not going to look at that and say, well, you know, we'll go our separate ways. I mean, what's implied in the decision that these priests... doesn't matter what church you belong to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're sincere, I'm sure. You know, the chief priests would have been wondering, what are you saying about what we did with Jesus of Nazareth? And so it's not surprising that in Acts 6... The first priests are described as converting to the way and getting baptized. And in Acts 7, we have our first martyr yeah. who is executed in Jerusalem, Stephen, you know. And at the end of that account in Acts 7, you have Saul giving consent to Stephen's martyrdom, which doesn't mean he was just standing by kind of nodding. It means that he was probably semi-officially yeah. sponsoring this sort of lynch well, you said, mob. he was a chief student. I mean, he was a top student. In fact, you think about it. You know, some of these other priests have gone that way, and he was probably belittling them. Exactly. He would have been so <laughs> provoked in his spirit to see priests defecting to that cause. You know, these men are fishermen from Galilee. We've got the experts in the law here. How could you, you know, and so if you were the Lord God Almighty, and you were to single out one guy for conversion and give him the spectacular grace, who better than the greatest student of the greatest rabbi? You know, because if you're going to send the gospel out to the Gentiles, with fishermen. You know, you can expect the rabbis to say, well, what do you expect? They're fishermen from Galilee. But when our best rabbi's prized pupil goes out claiming that the law and the prophets point to Jesus and the church is the fulfillment of these messianic prophecies and so on, then suddenly everybody's going to sit up and take notice and say, we have got to take this thing seriously. I wonder what happened to the career of Gamaliel. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he gives wise counsel to the Sanhedrin not to persecute the church, but it doesn't look like they were altogether convinced. Yeah. <laughs>
there's so many issues we could talk about with St. Paul, and this, in some ways, is just for this this year of St. Paul, it's just wetting our appetite. Right. But a couple questions that uh, that I've encountered in my own journey, um, especially looking back on my Protestant understanding of the faith and now Catholic. Right. Talk a bit about the relationship between Paul and the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. And maybe explain why there's an issue there, first of all. Well, let me explain the issue first, because I think a lot of Catholics approach Paul differently than they approach Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus in the Gospels, for most cradle Catholics that I've known, is like a home game, and you win most of those. <laughs> Whereas St. Paul is more like an away game. And you win a few, but you don't win most, you know, especially if you're a pirate fan from Pittsburgh or Steubenville like I am, you know. The away games are really hard. Well, you know, the fact is, as a Protestant, I felt similarly only the opposite. Because when I would read the Gospels, I'd be like, okay, there's a lot of emphasis on righteousness and works and obedience and giving alms and fasting and all of that. But well, no wonder, because that all was before Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, and so he was just reminding them of the Mosaic law and the burden that it places upon the believer so that, you know, you end up kind of exchanging that law for this gospel. And so as you move from the gospels to the epistles, you're really, you're moving from the end of the law to the beginning of the gospel. And so for me, Paul was the archetype. He was the source. He was the one you go to to really understand the truth after Jesus' death and resurrection. But to be honest, you know, the gospel according to St. Paul, which for years I interpreted as evangelical, Bible-believing, Christian, Calvinism, you know, <laughs> you know, I had been trained to read Romans that way and Galatians that way, but when I went deeper, when I got the Greek and I could read the original, when I studied the Hebrew and I could read the background that Paul was drawing from in the Old Testament, the scriptures of ancient Israel, that's when suddenly I got beyond the superficial and I began to realize that Paul is thinking like a Catholic. In Romans 5, he deals with original sin, but in Romans 6, the way out is not to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, but to get baptized because when you're baptized, you die and rise with Christ, and not just symbolically, but somehow spiritually and actually. And I thought, you know, if I were to write Romans, I would never have, you know, he zagged when I would have zigged. I would have gone from Romans 5 into inviting Christ into your heart as Savior and Lord. That's language that Paul never once uses anywhere in his epistles. <laughs> and here he is writing half the New Testament. You think that the Holy Spirit could have led him to say, the way you're saved is inviting Christ into your heart to be your Savior and Lord, and once saved, always saved, none of which was found there in his writings. So when I went back and rethought this, that's when I began to realize there is a strange convergence between what Christ is teaching in the Gospels and what Paul is teaching in the epistles. For example, Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, his first public sermon we find in Matthew 5 to 7, all about the fatherhood of God. 17 references to God as Father in his first sermon. That's more references to God as Father than the entire Old Testament. Well, you know, if you read Paul's letters, it too, they, they're just filled with references to God as Father and Christ the Son. For Saul the Pharisee to write that way would have been unthinkable. But only after you encounter the eternal Son of the eternal Father do you realize that all the language of God as Father in the Old Testament what is, wasn't metaphorical, it wasn't figurative, it was real, but you only come to know it with the coming of the Son. So the fatherhood of God, the family of the true believers, that's one thing. Jesus also says in the Sermon on the Mount that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom. Saul the Pharisee would have said, ouch, you're stepping on my toe. What do you mean, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? But Jesus goes on to say, you've heard that it was said to men of old, don't kill, don't commit adultery. You know, that's the civic code of Israel that establishes good citizens. Jesus says, but I say to you, and he's not talking about a civic law that establishes good citizenship. He's talking about internalizing that law so you don't get angry, you don't give in to lust. He's talking about becoming saints. That's the righteousness that goes beyond the scribes and the Pharisees. And that's exactly what Saul had to kind of wake up to and realize that when the Father sends the Son to give us the Holy Spirit, now it isn't just a promise, it is a fulfilled promise that through baptism makes us partakers of the divine nature. It draws us into a closer relationship with God than even Moses on top of Mount Sinai enjoyed. 
That's dramatic, but it also shows the profound convergence, the resonance, the deep agreement that you find between Jesus on the one hand and the Gospels and Paul in the epistles. The, the farce, a false dichotomy. Oh, and it's, it's very common. Maybe a simple way to summarize how I used to think of it and then address this is that I used to think of that before the cross, it was about my righteousness, and after the cross, it was about the righteousness of Christ. Right. I was saved before by my righteousness, Afterwards, I pointed to His righteousness. You just paraphrased Philippians 3 because there really is a true sense in which, you know, in the Old Testament, the ancient Israelites properly treasured the Word of God, yeah. especially the law of God, written with the finger of the Lord on these tablets of stone. I mean, what more could you want? Well, the Word made flesh dwelling among us. He's assuming what is ours, human nature, to give us what is His, divine nature, divine sonship. And so Saul, now Paul, says in Philippians, whatever I counted as gain, I now count as loss, refuse in comparison to having Christ. So it is no longer I who lives, he says to the Galatians, but Christ who lives in me. And to me, that is another breakthrough because Christ didn't come you know, in order to obey the law, suffer, die, and rise in order to get us off the hook. So we don't have to obey, although it's a great thing to do. We don't have to suffer, but we will if we don't have enough faith. No, Christ doesn't come as a substitute. In the Catholic tradition, following Paul, he comes as a representative. He, you know, Christ comes and assumes what is ours, human nature, to give us what is his, divine nature, so that he obeys, not in order to get us off the hook, to exempt us from obedience, but to empower us with His Spirit to reproduce in us nothing less than His own divine sonship, His own love, His own willingness to suffer, die, and rise. That notion of Christ the representative is much closer to Paul than Christ the substitute. We participate through the Spirit in Christ. And so the Spirit comes to us, and especially in the church, through the sacraments, as Paul taught me, we end up receiving nothing less than Christ's own divine sonship. That's, I mean, that, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> Let me scratching the surface too. I mean, you're, 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 you're uh, getting into, in many ways, sort of thinking that maybe our average viewer is not used to thinking in terms of the depth of what you're talking about. True, but Paul's writings do that because on the yeah. one hand, he's very practical, he's very personal, and yet suddenly he's very profound and very passionate. I can relate because, you know, sometimes people who are passionate aren't very profound, and people <laughs> who are profound are boring, you know. But if the truth grips yeah. you, how can you not be passionate about the truth? And what is more passionate, you know, what is worth getting more passionate about than this divine grace? I want to throw an idea out and see what your, th your thought on this is. Um, Paul's emphasis on the law. Yeah. <clears throat> Often I've found in the 15 years I've been a Catholic and I've unexpectedly have spent most of those years dealing with converts. Uh, that wasn't necessarily my choice, but that's what God is. God's doing. choice. Okay. And what I've often found is that often converts, after they come to the church, often the focus of what they emphasize is because it is either a counteraction to what they used to focus on. That's right. It's compensatory. You know, so yeah. you have in James focusing on one thing, maybe because of where he came from. Right. Is that why Paul focused on the law because the issue of the law, because he came from such a high level Pharisee? I think you're right. I think the reason why Paul focuses on how we are not under law, but under grace, is because he, more than any, any other contemporary of his, saw himself under law and that, that, was his, that was the source of his identity, that was the source of his righteousness, and that's how he understood mm -hmm. grace. I mean, we didn't deserve God giving us the law, and yet he, he spoke the word, he wrote the word, he's delivered his will to us. I mean, this is undeserved favor. That's grace in the Old Testament. But when you discover that the word is now made flesh, that the Father sends the Son to give us the Spirit to adopt us and make us members of a divine family, mm -hmm. then suddenly the graciousness of a law that we didn't deserve is exceeded by infinity, by the graciousness of the Son who becomes the servant in order to make us servants nothing less than divine sons. It would seem then that, you know, those that put such an emphasis on really Paul is all about the law, that to really to see that in its context is to look at it from the, where he came from. That's right. 
And you know, in, in the book of Romans in chapter seven, he speaks of the law as holy, just, and yeah. good. And in Romans eight, where suddenly he just turns in the fire hydrant, there you find more references yeah. to the Holy Spirit than anywhere else in the New Testament. I think it's 17 or 18 references to the Holy Spirit in Romans eight. But the Spirit comes to us, why? In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, bound just to the law, but to the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to us to empower us to do what we could never do in the Old Testament on our own, keep the law and fulfill our Father's will. Talking also a bit about the importance of, oh man, so many things. <laughs> uh, when you interpret Paul's letters, how important it is to be looking at them through Catholic eyes. And particularly I'm thinking about like for example, understanding Ephesians as a document about baptism. I mean, the importance of understanding Catholic things from his Catholic early church background. Right. And for your and my background, when we interpreted those letters without that. Oh, I tell you, you know, I'm getting ready to go off to Dallas and Fort Worth this weekend to join uh, Brant Petrie and Steve Ray and Michael Barber. We're gonna be doing the gospel according to St. Paul, but it's the Catholic gospel. <laughs> We're gonna be going through Romans and Ephesians I, now that I mentioned, I should say, yeah, it's uh, Google <laughs> fullnessoftruth.org or <laughs> fullness of truth. I shouldn't have said it without mentioning Ken Zamet? Yeah, oh, right, yeah, that excellent, whole, excellent, it's just a wonderful time. Excellent. But the, uh, the exciting part of it is, you don't have to look very far, well, oh, here's a Catholic element, oh, here's another fragment that is Catholic. I mean, when you really begin to get the inner logic of Romans, or Galatians, or Ephesians, or one and two Corinthians, you realize that the reasoning that Paul is exemplifying holds together according to a logic that is Catholic. And at times it's not just implicit. At times, I mean, he just comes right out and says things that I wondered, how would I affirm that sort of thing as, you know, yeah. a pro 1 Corinthians 11, where he speaks of how you profane, not a symbol of Christ's body, you profane the actual body of Christ when you receive the Eucharist unworthily without the discerning the Lord's body. I mean, I know I had a clever response, but I would never have written those words the way Paul did. Yeah, sometimes I find myself, just as I said before, as a convert, for example, on my Deep in Scripture radio program, emphasizing those things yes. against what I used to be, but we Catholics need to read the Bible too. I mean, I'm being That's a little right. facetious here because Ephesians 4 that talks about the, that the apostles and the teachers and the evangelists are for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I mean, there we see the structure in the church so that it isn't just the leaders in the church, it's not just their job. That's right. It's us too. And, and, and that's why it isn't like, well, we emphasize a sacramental bond as opposed to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, the that's sacramental that. bond that we, we, we celebrate in the Holy Eucharist should lead us to the deepest conceivable personal relationship with Jesus, the lover of our souls, who feeds us with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so it isn't like, well, you have the Bible, we have tradition. We have traditions so we can go into the scriptures with greater freedom and greater confidence and just really find the truth in its fullness. Likewise, faith and works. We have faith in order to really trust God's word and his spirit to reproduce Christ's works in us. The, the scripture that I was gonna grab here real quick, which I wanted to kind of bring to a, a thought is this, um, to me, which is one of the most powerful summaries is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, which you talk about intimate relationship. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Right. I mean, the sense of that summary of all that he wants to do to make us truly dare I use this word, divine. Yeah, I mean, you can use it. Because, I mean, some I mean, of our audience may, may be shocked that we use that word, because yeah, well, they may understand what we mean by it. Saints, doctors of the church, they do. I mean, right. the whole point as not two gods, one, but children of God. Yes. And, and not just in name, but in reality. As, one, as 2 Peter 1, 4 says, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. Our adoption is not a legal fiction. You know, God becomes 
humans so that humans can partake of this divine nature. I mean, this sounds so speculative, almost philosophical, and yet for Paul, as you point out in Ephesians 4, 20 and following, this is the most practical and the most demanding for our personal lives. But he wouldn't have gotten to those verses in Ephesians 4 unless he had laid the foundation in the first half of the chapter where he says there's one Lord, one faith, one God and Father, one baptism, one church, one body. And so it's the unity of the church which doesn't institutionalize our experience of Christ. It actually deepens how much of a personal relationship we as individuals can have with the Lord of Lords. Yeah, I remember when I was a Protestant minister, I used to say that chapters one, two, three describe, in Ephesians, they describe what happens after you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then chapters four, five, and six are what you have to do now that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. When you understand historically, chapters one, two, and three are what happens in baptism. That's right. That is what baptism does to you and it's a reality. Yeah, he doesn't say we will be seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In Ephesians two, he says <laughs> we are. You know, we can't see it because we walk by faith, not by sight. But what the Holy Spirit does in uniting us to Christ through baptism, if we could see what our guardian angels do see, we would fall over. I mean, the, the, the glory of the grace of God that Paul discovered through baptism in the Eucharist, in the life of this mystical body of Christ, it exceeds all words. I mean, he did his level best to put into words yeah. the truth. But he says in Ephesians 3, when you read this, you'll realize the revelation of the mystery that was given to me. And he says, I'm the least deserving of all. Yeah. And I think we both can relate to oh, that. <laughs> ain't that the truth? And then this, this issue of baptism, you know, the, in many ways, I think chapters four, five, and six are especially for us Catholics. Because there's some Catholics that think, well, I was baptized, I've arrived. Because yeah. everything that's in chapters one, two, and three is true. But now that's we right. gotta live it out. That's right. And every time we do this with the holy water, we're renewing our covenant bond, yeah. You know, there are, John Paul has made this comment, Pope Benedict as well. There are a lot of Catholics who are sacramentalized, but not evangelized. Yeah. Just like there are not a, a lot of non-Catholics who are evangelized, but they haven't been led to discover yeah. the truth and the power, the, the beauty of the, of the sacraments. It's not either or. You know, they're really yeah. mutually reinforcing. If we could only grasp the, the gift of God in the sacraments, we would say personal relationship. You want an intimate relationship, this is the bond. All right, Scott, let's take a break. Come back with your questions for Dr. Paul. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Dr. Scott Hahn, and uh, we've got a lot of questions before I do that. Scott didn't come to the show to promote a book, but I really wanted to take the chance to mention one of his many, it was one of his newer books, one of his many books though, Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Explain, and Defend the Catholic Faith. And uh, I'm not just saying this because he slipped me any money, because he didn't, but uh, <laughs> I think this is one of Scott's best. And I've made sure all my sons have read this book and I've passed it on because it's not just defense of the Catholic faith, it starts from scratch. I mean, the reality of God. You know, right. it really deals with the whole issue in a very winsome way. And I, the reason I wanted my sons, who are good, strong Catholics, but my oldest son is studying at a secular university. So I wanted to make sure he's prepared. Because mm -hmm. they're going to get, in fact, you, the other book which I read of yours recently with Ben Wicker, Yes, Answering the New Atheism. Oh, awesome book too. Well, you know, that book grew out of this book because, you know, you could only deal with so much. And so I try to show the classical yeah. arguments for the existence of God, miracles, prophecy, the Bible, and then the Catholic Church, the sacraments, but with the aggressive forms of the New Atheism wow. in Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, and other sources, you realize that the next generation is now faced with a kind of fundamentalist atheism that is shouting and, and, and yeah. it's really shrill but it needs to be answered in a way that is really patient and penetrating. And so I couldn't do it in this book, 
And so Dr. Ben Weicker, a good friend of mine, yeah. and I sat down he's and worked through. He's been on this through. show. Yeah, 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 yeah he's yeah. incredible. He's great. And again, I had my sons read that because I remember the, the motive for that book was not just that, that our students are encountering these at secular campuses. But, I mean, we had students who graduated from our school who went off, read that book, and lost their faith. Yeah. Thanks be to God. Not We've your been book, in read the Dawkins book. Dawkins <laughs> book, The God Delusion. Yeah, thanks for that little <laughs> clarification. Yeah. I don't know of anybody who's <laughs> lost their faith from this. But, uh, <laughs> oh, good. That's good. Anyway. <laughs> Let's take our first email. Linda from Wisconsin. Thank you for your excellent programs. Your show is the highlight of our week. Thank you. I'd appreciate your explanation of why the Gospel of St. Peter was rejected from the canon of scriptures. Since we believe him to be the first pope, I don't understand why his gospel was not included. Thank you both for your excellent ministries and your examples to many of us converts. Thank you, Linda. You know, this is an example of the secular propaganda that's out there. You know, in, in, in a lot of different sources, uh, public television, National Geographic, what about the gospel of Thomas? What about the gospel of Judas? And what about the gospel of, of Peter? Well. If it had been written by Peter, you can be sure the church would have accepted it, but it wasn't. It's a forgery. That's why it was rejected. You know, likewise, the Gospel of Thomas was not written by the Apostle Thomas. It was a Gnostic Gospel. It was a forgery, and it was used to kind of, you know, present truths, present errors, Gnostic beliefs as truths to get Christians to accept this. And so the church had to really use a, a great deal of spiritual discernment in recognizing authentic apostolic writings from those that really were. In, in fact, in the early days of the church, there were some of what later were not in the Gospels, or were not in the New Testament, that for a while were included That's as right. candidates. Uh, the the Shepherd of Hermas, Shepherd Barnabas, of the Didache. Clement. Right, and so you, you had those that were really welcomed and read and, and authentic upon. That's and, right. and even encouraged to be read by believers. Right, and you also had some of the books that were included in the New Testament, Second Peter, for example, James, Hebrews, they were anti-legomena. In some circles, people questioned whether those were authentic. And the church said, yes, these are authentic. They will be included. And then you have things like the Gospel of Thecla, Paul, Peter, Thomas, Judas, and so on. And universally, the church recognized that these were fraudulent Gospels. All right, let's take our first call. Sandy from Florida. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Sandy? Uh, hi. Hi. This is um, Sandy from Illinois. Oh, Illinois, sorry. And uh, that's okay. No, I wanted to make sure I was the right Sandy. That's right. Um, I am a former Catholic, and I am now an evangelical, so I know you understand where I'm coming from. Sure. Could you please explain uh, the Catholic teaching in light of the New Testament regarding purgatory? All right, Sandy, thank you for that fine question. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, first of all, Jews have always prayed for their dead, before Christ and up to this present day. You know, and as C.S. Lewis, who was a believer in purgatory, though he was not a Catholic, you know, he and others have pointed out that if you're praying for your dead, you know, if they're in heaven, they don't need prayer. If they're in hell, prayer's not gonna do them any good. So, you know, where are they? Well, in Hebrew, there's a term Sheol that is not the same as what we would call Gehenna. Jesus speaks of hellfire as Gehenna. Sheol is the place where the righteous mm -hmm. and the unrighteous went. And that's why the Jews have always prayed for them. So even if you don't have 2 Maccabees in your Bible, if you read 2 Maccabees 12 and you discover that the, the prayers of the, for the dead are being offered then and by Jews today, you can see why because they really believed that there were people who could benefit. Well, why? Well, what was Sheol in Hebrew becomes Hades in Greek. Again, it's not to be confused with Gehenna. Hades is an intermediate state. When it's translated into Latin, it's called purgatorio because it's a place of purgation. It's a place of purging, cleansing. You know, Hebrews 12, 29 describes God as a consuming fire. Now we often associate fire with hell, but actually the imagery of fire is more commonly used in the descriptions of heaven because that's where the, the seraphim, the burning ones who are the closest angels to God, seraphim literally means in Hebrew the burning ones. They're burning with the pure love of God. And so it is, we have to be filled with the Spirit to have that love purify us. And in this life we have our chance to really follow Christ. But you'll notice that Paul states in 1 Corinthians 3 that there are some people who build on the foundation of Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones through works that really represent the Holy Spirit reproducing Christ in us. Other people Paul describes as building with wood, hay, and straw. Mm -hmm. 
That work, he says, will be burned up. But he goes on to say this, and it's so important. The work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So he will suffer, and he will suffer and lose as he passes through the fire of the Spirit who will purify all of these false good works. Now, if time flies when you're having fun, time slows down when you're not, when you pass through the fire of judgment, which exposes the false, you know, the inadequate or the superficial good deeds that you've done, when you pass through the fire of God's love as judgment, you know, that might, might take, you know, five minutes, but it might feel like you know, a lot longer. <laughs> But Paul is describing people who are going to be saved, but only as they pass through fire, and they will suffer loss, but they will be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. What struck me as a Protestant was, if I had a thousand epistles to write, I would never have penned those verses. <laughs> I would never describe someone who is passing through fire, suffering, and yet they're going to be saved. And yet Paul, as a good Jew and a good Catholic Christian, can write this sort of thing in a matter-of-fact way, just by way of reminder to kind of jog the Corinthian memory that we, we ought to be careful how we allow the Holy Spirit to build in our lives gold, silver, and precious stones, not the counterfeit works that those who are saved but are going to end up having to suffer a great deal as they pass through this fire. And we're, our evangelical brothers and sisters often miss the point of that is their emphasis often merely on saved or not. That's right. You're saved or not. In fact, a good portion of those look back to a time in the past when I was irretrievably saved or not because I was once saved, always saved. And so this whole concept doesn't fit their categories because they have that emphasis. Right. And it's also a different view of sin, what sin does. Yes, indeed. Because sin is not just broken laws. Sin is a broken life, a broken heart, a broken home. And so the Holy Spirit comes as the fire to restore that love. Yeah. But we often say yes and don't mean it. Or we often say yes and then end up kind of turning our backs. And so, you know, the, the Catholic doctrine was not something that I could understand, but I remember wrestling with this text, going back to the Jewish tradition of prayers for the dead, the Jewish notion of Sheol, the New Testament notion of Hades, which is not the same as hell, Gehenna, and then suddenly I could see why the early fathers would speak of a place like Purgatorio as a place where the Spirit purges the, the, the leftover dross yeah. to purify the gold so that we can yeah. enter into the not presence of God. Not a second chance. That's right. You know, these people are going to be saved, but only passing through fire and only after suffering loss. How could Paul write this apart from believing in what the Catholic Church explains later on in terms of purgatory? Well, it, it makes, I can't remember which verses, I think it's in First John where it's, and I, maybe it was Paul that talks about us, our desires to stand before him without embarrassment. Right. Well, Paul that's what happens. So does First John. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what happens. That's why purgatory. S you know, if we haven't lived perfectly in this life, well then, Purgatory so that we can stand before him without embarrassment, without hesitation, purely cleansed in the right clothing Nothing of the wedding feast. Nothing unholy can enter the presence of God, and yet when we die, we sometimes have that lack of holiness left that the Holy Spirit has not yet completely uprooted. All right, let's take this next email from Melissa, New Jersey. Hi, Marcus and Dr. Hall, and I returned home to the church a year ago. Welcome home. Yes. And am truly living my faith for the first time. Unfortunately, I have found myself faith faced with a great deal of misunderstanding and at times anti-Catholic arguments and comments. Did you ever face this kind of reaction in your conversion? I know you didn't, Scott, but I did. But I'll let you come up with some idea because I know you never really faced any opposition. We go on. <laughs> How did you best handle these disagreements both personally and in apologetics? Melissa, thank you for your email. I would say <laughs> back in 86 when I first decided to become a Catholic, I faced a tsunami, <laughs> you know, <laughs> tidal waves in the plural of opposition, you know. And the first thing I would do was to re remind my, my evangelical Bible-believing friends that I too was anti-Catholic and probably much more anti-Catholic than they were. <laughs> and I would try to restate their arguments against the Catholic Church as well as I could, which was often better than they could because I used to hold them with such vehemence. And then I would try to kind of not refute them in the sense of, of just beating them in an argument, but I would try to show how 
as a Catholic, I'm not an ex-evangelical. I feel more evangelical than ever. I'm not an ex-Bible Christian. I feel like a whole new depth to Scripture has been, has been shown to me. And so I would, I would usually try to say, look, here's the common ground that we share as Protestants and Catholics. It's much greater than our differences. Let's begin and end with the common ground, with the Bible, and let's move into those areas of disagreement and I'll try to address your differences from my beliefs in terms of what we share in common. Because so often I found in conversations, this not only fosters friendship and keeps ties from being broken, but it also shows them that it isn't something that requires the abandonment of all of the truths that you came to cherish as a Christian. It means that you're just taking them and it's not subtraction, but addition. You're just discovering that they lead to even deeper truths about Jesus and the sacraments and the church is the family of God and so on. All right, thank you. And for those that are dealing with some of those issues, I would recommend Reasons to Believe because that's right. exactly what you deal with in that book. Indeed. All right, let's take our next caller, Diana from Massachusetts. Hello, Diana, what's your question? Hi, Marcus. Hi, Scott. First, uh, Scott, I just wanted to say awesome conference this past Saturday at St. Joseph's here in oh. Charlton. <laughs> I was just um, talking. My question is, why does God, or why did God change names in the Bible, like when he changed Saul to Paul, or Abram to Abraham, or Sarai to Sarah? And I'll hang up and All listen right, to your answer. Thank you. And Thank God you very God. much. Thank you very much, Diana. Good question. I mean, you have Abram getting his name changed in Genesis 17 to Abraham because there's a whole new calling and a whole new identity. You have Simon being renamed Peter because of a whole new identity and a whole new vocation. In the case of Paul, it actually isn't a divine name change though because Saul was his Jewish name. Be being a citizen of Tarsus automatically conferred Roman citizenship upon him. And so Saul is a Jewish name in Hebrew, but Paulus is the Roman name that reflects his own Roman citizenship. And even though God didn't use, God didn't change his name from one to the other, God most certainly did use his Roman citizenship as well as this Roman name to launch this man to be the apostle to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. And so, you know, even while there isn't the same kind of name change, I think we can recognize in the book of Acts as we move from Saul to Paul, we move from someone who's really clinging to the old covenant to someone who's discovered that the fulfillment of this has just opened God's family now to all the nations. All right. Uh, looks like for a second we may have drained all the, is there an email? Okay, there we go. I didn't have one there. I know there's a ton of them. I know we can't get to them all, but I was wondering why. Anyways, this comes from Farah in North Carolina. She writes, Dear Marcus and Scott, how can I explain to Seventh-day Adventists the reason why we Catholics worship on Sunday? They seem to excuse us accuse us of, no, of not following God's commandment of observing the Sabbath by changing the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. Please help me explain this because I can't seem to find any biblical explanation for this. Thanks and God bless. And thank you, Farah. First, I want to recommend a book by a cardinal named Jean Danielou. His first name looks like Jean, J-E-A-N. The last name Danielou is simply Daniel with an O-U at the end. It was published 50 years ago by Notre Dame Press. It's still in print. I just checked really? last week on uh -huh. Amazon. It's called The Bible and the Liturgy. And what Daniel Lu does is he goes back to the Old and New Testaments and then the early church fathers and shows the significance of the seventh day and of the first day of the week, the resurrection day, and how the Sabbath is transformed to Sunday as the Lord's Day. And just to summarize what I learned from rereading him recently, you know, as circumcision in the old gave way to baptism in the new, you have a bloody ritual leading to a cleansing ritual. So Passover, an annual festival slaughtering the lamb and eating that is giving way to the Eucharist, which is the new Passover. So in the old covenant, you worked and worked and waited until the Lord would send the rest, the eternal rest of salvation. And so how appropriate it was for the first six days to be work days and then the seventh day to be the day of rest because you were still waiting in anticipation for God to fulfill the promise of salvation or rest. But in the new covenant, before we're working, before we're even born, God has achieved our salvation in Christ who has, as Hebrews 4 puts it, achieved our eternal Sabbath rest. 
And so how appropriate it is that on the first day of the week and all the resurrection appearances that are identified as to what day of the week they occurred on, all occurred on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Not only was he raised on Sunday, but his appearances are all on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So in the early church, as you move from circumcision to baptism, from the Passover to the Eucharist, so it was in Acts 20, they gather on the Lord's day, the first day of the week in Revelation 1.10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. These casual references show us that there was a certain transition that was done pretty easily with the power of the Spirit guiding the apostles so that the early church didn't circumcise, but they sure baptized. <laughs> they didn't sacrifice the lamb, but they celebrated the, the lamb in the Eucharist. And likewise, it's not the seventh day at the end of our work, but the first day, because Christ has achieved our rest before we even pick up a hammer or shovel. All right. Very good, Scott. Let's Try to get one more caller, at least Bob right. in Wisconsin. Hello, Bob. What's your question for us? Hello. My question is for Dr. Hahn. What I would like to ask is that in your book, Rome Sweet Home, in a chapter written by Kimberly, she's talking to a former classmate of yours, and they're discussing John 6:63, where it says, "The Spirit gives life; the flesh profits nothing." And Kimberly explains that it's not the uh, cannibalism, as the people who walked away apparently took it to be but rather that it's the resurrected, glorified body of Christ that we receive. I wondered if you're in agreement with that. Is that the Catholic understanding? And a second question, which I don't mean it to be a, a stupid question, but it may sound that way, but I'm curious, what, what translation of the Bible is it that you're using there? What, what Bible do you wow. use? Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Second question is easier. It's the RSVC. It's the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. The, uh, the first question, I would say, in John 6, when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and I'll raise you up, and then he goes on to say that the flesh availeth nothing, it's the spirit that gives life. His point is not to negate what he had previously said. When he says, the flesh availeth nothing, he doesn't say, my flesh availeth nothing. He's speaking about the flesh, that is our flesh. And so when he says, you know, my flesh is food indeed, my flesh, my blood is drink indeed, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, what he's going on to say in verse 63 is, what makes his flesh so different than our flesh? Our flesh which is so weak, his flesh which is so strong, it's the spirit. The flesh availeth nothing, it's the spirit that gives life, but the spirit uses the instrument of Christ's flesh and blood to give us this divine life so that he abides in us and we abide in him precisely through this flesh which communicates nothing less than the Holy Spirit. All right. Thank Hope you, that helps. Right. Thank you. We've got a couple minutes left. Let me ask you a final question sure. to our audience. Um, what difference does it make whether we're Catholic or not? Well, you know, in this year of St. Paul, I think what we can celebrate as Catholic Christians is not only the ecumenical uh, common ground that we share, which is substantial, and we tend to neglect that, but how it is that the truths of Scripture in general, and especially the truths of St. Paul's epistles, mm -hmm. lead us to recognize that when he says in Galatians 3.28, there's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, what he's talking about is that you know, there's no second-class citizenship any longer because God is fathering a, a family that is worldwide, international. Uh, the early fathers had a word for that, katholikos, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Mm -hmm. It's the Catholicity of the church that is the newness of the new covenant. Up until Christ, he was fathering a family that was national. Now it's international, it's worldwide. And we as Catholics in the year of St. Paul can just come to a whole much, uh, a much greater appreciation for this birthright that we have in baptism, this incredible grace that we have by having God as our father, Christ as our brother, Mary as a mother, the saints as older brothers and sisters, and Rome as a kind of place that reminds us of our international unity. And I might say, this is the theme. We're gonna do a pilgrimage to celebrate St. Paul, uh, the, the St. Paul Center, March 14 through 22, just to celebrate what it means to join this Catholic family, this international household. Uh, I hope that gets at it, but I mean, to me, <laughs> that is what is really so awesome about being Catholic. Well, something with it also, just to tag on, we got another minute, is it seems to me that one of the, the, the largest heresies of at least the 20th century and on into this one is this idea that all that's necessary is Jesus and me. Yeah. And it would seem to me that at least as Catholics, we emphasize that Christ intended there to be a church 
as the channel through which we receive the graces of salvation. That's right. And it our isn't culture just Jesus and is me. steeped in individualism. Yeah. And so easily and so frequently we just kind of project that. Yeah. That's yeah. And I think this vision of God's fatherhood and of the church as this worldwide family not only counteracts it, but it just trumps it. It's sort of like, why were we just settling for a person relationship when we can enter into this glorious communion? As we close, Scott, uh, what's the place they can get in touch with you on the internet? Uh, SalvationHistory.com is mm -hmm. our website for the St. Paul Center. We also have a phone number that they might be putting up on the screen, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, that is where we can find all kinds of tools and resources for Catholic biblical study and theology. All right, yeah. Scott, it's always great to have you on the journey home. And oh, good to be I haven't said this before, I also am very grateful to God that uh, your witness and Kimberly's came into my life because it's what started my journey home to the Catholic Church. So, so grateful you for your friendship, but also for the amazing graces God is doing through you. Well, well, thank you very much, Scott. Thank you for joining us on this episode, special episode of The Journey Home. And uh, I want you to always watch us because we pray that through our witness, we also can help you discover and enjoy the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and His church. God bless you. See you again soon.